We can get started. Um, welcome and thank you for joining Prevail and RSI Security today for our webinar on how to launch your CMMC compliance and receive guidance from an upcoming C3 PAO. We'll discuss the in and outs of the CMMC implementation timeline and how to ensure you'll have a successful pre-assessment, how to progress from DFLARS to CMMC, and the consequences of non-compliance. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar to submit your questions to our panelists and we'll cover as many questions as we can. Next, I'd like to introduce our host organizations. Prevail provides end-to-end -end encryption document collaboration and email for business. Prevail's unique um, approach provides unmatched security and privacy that helps companies efficiently achieve compliance objectives without disrupting existing IT investments and processes. True end-to-end -end encryption has recently been endorsed by the NSA and the US Department of State as the preferred means to share and protect sensitive information. RSI Security is a cybersecurity and compliance advisory provider servicing highly regulated business industries, including government, healthcare, and financial services. RSI Security is a CMMC AB registered practitioner organization with a team of CMMC AB registered practitioners and a C3PAO certification is on the way. Next, we'll meet our panelists. My name is Cassandra McMahon. I'm an information security uh, specialist with RSI Security and I am a CMMC AB registered practitioner. Mohan, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hey, Cassandra. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Mohan Shamachar. Uh, I am a certified assessor advisor at RSI Security. I'm also a registered practitioner, uh, just waiting to become a certified uh, a practitioner and assessor uh, for CMMC assessments. Over to you, Greg. Thanks, Mohan. Uh, hi, I'm Greg LaRoche, and uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, I'm, I'm head of product at Prevail, which is, uh, we're a technology company, as you just heard. And um, as part of my responsibility, I not only uh, keep track of the product roadmap and priorities, but I'm also very involved in compliance as a, a key requirement for our technology and our offerings in the market. So uh, I can offer a, a technology perspective today. Great, thank you so much. Um, so today's webinar, we'll be uh, going over the CMMC implementation timeline maturity versus implementation and uh, CMMC uh, domains, policies and procedures, um, CMMC assessment scoping process. Then we'll move on to audience questions with the most um, requested questions that were submitted. And then of course, the uh, submitted a qu questions that come in. And then we'll have a breakout session after for those that would like to stick around and get more questions answered, um, even if it's past the time. So moving into the CMMC implementation timeline, Mohan, what would you say would be the, the timeline that CMMC is taking? Uh, thanks, Cassandra. Uh, so essentially, uh, as most of you know, um, CMMC sent out an interim rule uh, in November 2020. Um, so they have embarked on a, um, almost a six year process here, uh, what they call a crawl, walk, run uh, approach. Um, with the 2020 interim rule, now the CMMC rule is in effect, which means uh, all organizations must at least perform uh, self-assessments and self-attestations for 8171 and also meet basic uh, 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 level one uh, requirement. And, um, uh, you know, and, and then they also have this, you know, how, how many organizations need to be on level one? How many organizations need to be on level two and level three? So at, at the moment, not all organizations need to be on level three. Um, they, you know, DOD in the RFIs and uh, uh, RPs, they pick who should be on what level uh, and they specify that um, and they pick and choose. So uh, right now, no organization should be worried about uh, becoming a level three compliant as of today. But um, uh, by, by 2025, um, all organizations, uh, all, you know, uh, there will be a CMMC clause in all contracts and all organizations need to provide 
uh, DOD access uh, to the systems for advanced assessment. They should be, uh, you know, uh, getting audited by uh, uh, C3PAOs and getting certified and so on. Um, and um, um, so it's a, it's a multi-dimensional, um, you know, going by the calendar, going by the requirements and going by which organizations and complexity. So, that, so what they call crawl, walk and run approach um, from now on till 2025 and beyond. Thank you. Um, and so for the contractors, um, which is defined on the next slide, for the contractors that are familiar with DFARS and this engagements previously, what can they expect to be different with CMMC and the number of requirements? I'm on, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, thanks, Cassandra. Um, so uh, CMMC is a maturity model. Um, uh, you know, if you compare uh, in the past, um, you, anyone who has done 8171 or any other uh, NIST-based uh, assessments, they know that you know the maturity aspect was not really addressed. The process uh, part was not really addressed. Uh, either you know yes you implemented you have some policies and you're ready to go. Um, so now with the CMMC, um, you know the maturity the, the the emphasis is on maturity. Um, so at level one, uh, all you know it focuses on uh, whether the practices are implemented. Um, and after level one, the processes kick in uh, for, you know, and uh, essentially uh, the processes are, you know, how well you have documented, how well you're, you're, you're following the documentation, how well you're implementing it, how well you're practicing it, and um, uh, how consistent, how repeated the process is. So it, it, it comes down to scoring. Um, so every contractor who will be going through the level three assessment or beyond the level one will be scored according to um, the process maturity. Uh, so that's the big difference between um, you know, the, the past assessments and the future assessments. And then finally, um, everything is, you know, the, the base is 8171. And uh, they have brought in uh, additional practices um, on top of 8171, um, uh, you know, from various other uh, uh, assessment and frameworks and domains. Um, uh, to fit uh, for the CMMC security uh, requirements. So essentially uh, the, the, the summary is that it is additional practices at various levels on top of HN171. Uh, and uh, level one is equivalent to the, the, the basic for uh, federal acquisition reg regulation requirement. And, uh, and, and then, uh, and it's cumulative. Uh, you know, if you, are, if you have done level one, if you want to get to level three, you have to do level one plus level two, and then the level three. So it's all um, cumulative um, as you progress along different levels of uh, um, uh, maturity at your organization. Right, and that really shows with the um, you know NIST having total of 110 practices going to the CMMC level three, which shows you know 130 practices. Um, Greg. For you know, CMMC, they state that maturity is a major factor in being able to earn certification. For example, like Mohan had mentioned, policies which are already required for NIST, for NIST but must be implemented at first CMMC level three and adopted into the company culture. What is the real meaning between maturity and implementation for CMMC? Yeah, thanks. I yeah, let's start with. Um, maybe just a, an example of the, you know, why the levels are relevant as well. And because uh, the question uh, was framed around level three, which is where the standard introduces the, the concept of protecting controlled unclassified information or CUI. Mm -hmm. So at that level, um, you know, a lot of additional controls kick in. And, and like you said, the, the NIST 171 plus 20 more um, have to be demonstrated with maturity and have to be, uh, you have to prove that they're in place and, and in use and actually um, you know, part of your company process and culture, which is slightly different from the previous NIST-based uh, assessments, which, which were, uh, like Mohan said earlier, um, didn't really focus much on maturity and the actual uh, historical proof that these controls have been in place for some amount of time, um, but more, it was more important just to have them in place. So um, that's a new concept that uh, CMMC is largely based on you know, one of the M's is maturity. So uh, part of what the assessor is going to be looking for is uh, not only have you implemented 
say, technologies that help you gain compliance and also policies and procedures that are required, but are they actually being used and worked and, and are there artifacts being generated that an assessor can look at? Absolutely. Um, so with that being said, um, on to the next slide, we look at or we are looking at some of the domains that are incorporated into CNMC and they look very familiar to NIST. There are a couple additions um, and some of these domains can be quite technical like access control and accountability, identification, authentication, just to name a few. And there are usually major gaps for especially smaller organizations and contractors. Uh, Greg, what are some of the options that contractors have to meet some of these technical requirements? Yeah, that's a great question. And one we get a lot from our customers um, because something as comprehensive as CMMC and I'll, and I'll, I'll limit my con comments more to a level three requirement because that's really what we're most familiar with with our technology. Um, for companies that are planning to be able to handle CUI, you know, how do they, how do they approach such a, a comprehensive standard? And really it comes into three buckets or three categories and technology can help and technology is part of it, but it's not the whole solution. So you might say in, in this instance, the green boxes represent things that can be very largely accomplished with technology, a product like Prevail or others. Um, the blue sections are what we call shared responsibility. So technology is part of it and also documentation, process, um, policy, and uh, demonstration of implementation of those policies is in addition to the technology alone. And the yellow ones are really not technical at all and are purely policy and procedure oriented for the typical company. So, um, so it's important when you think about um, you know, technology selection as part of your CMMC journey, um, you definitely wanna consider the entire solution set not just the technology on a standalone basis, because there's a lot more that you have to build around that in order to uh, accomplish your true uh, standards uh, compliance. Right, um, and it's it's a lot, really. Um, so for the next, you know, all of this is encompassed into you know, essentially getting assessment, which is slightly different from the process of being assessed for NIST. Um, on the next slide here, you know. What does the CMMC assessment process look like? Um, Mohan, if you could talk a little bit about that. Got it. Um, so I think the, the this is a great slide this uh, straight from the uh, CMMC AB. Um, um, as you can see, um, about seven, you know, according to the DOD, about 70 to 80% of all the, uh, the service organizations or the contractors who are going to be part of the supply chain, they all need to be level one um, certified. Um, so there are, you know, uh, and, and, and FCI, FCI is, 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 is the uh, content that's in focus for most organizations. And many organizations do not store CUI at all. Uh, so for those uh, who do uh, store CUI or transmit and process, uh, yes, of course, uh, they need to be marching towards uh, the level three uh, compliance. So in any case, um, see, uh, the, the, level, the level is identified by the uh, RFI and RFP from the Department of Defense uh, as, as the years uh, roll along. And so every contractor knows what that level uh, they should be uh, certified at. Uh, so there's no doubt about that. Um, and then, uh, so now, now um, uh, contractors, uh, they you know uh, they may not be um, uh, uh, self-assessed yet, and they do not know whether um, they're ready for the assessment. Uh, can we uh, go and go to the marketplace and uh, bring in a C3PAO and, and get a, a certified assessor and uh, uh, perform the assessment? So, uh, so you, you you need to be you need to make sure that you're ready for that. So you have uh, several options. Um, you can uh, self-assess or you can go with a registered practitioner organization um, and uh, get the help of registered practitioners and consultants to ensure that you are uh, ready. So over there, there are two different ways. One is the readiness, another is pre-assessment. Uh, th there are differences between the two, they're not the same. And uh, so um, finally, uh, when uh, uh, the contractor is ready, uh, they can go to a C3PAO in the marketplace uh, that's a CMMC marketplace, 
and then uh, select a C3PAO and then get the assessment done. And uh, C3PAO um, uh, provides a certificate and also they report, um, they file a report with the DOD uh, as well um, after the assessment. So, and the certificate is valid for uh, three years, you know, which means uh, for next three years, you're good to go uh, unless major changes happen and you want to assess yourself again. So that's, uh, that's a three year validity uh, for the certification. Right. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, with all that being said, what are, you know, the repercussions of not maintaining compliance? Um, so uh, as of now, uh, all contracts uh, require, um, you know, self-attestation, level one at least. Um, and uh, uh, there is a reason why CMMC, uh, DOD created the CMMC model. We want to ensure that there is a uniform uh, across the supply chain uh, standard for contractors to be uh, cybersecurity compliant and, and with a maturity model. Uh, so no one is left behind. Um, so today, uh, one organization can say, oh, I have implemented 90 controls. Another uh, uh, organization can say, I have implemented 110. Now they both can submit a proposal and uh, it's possible that the company that has implemented only the 90 of them may get picked for the contract. Uh, so that's not setting a standard. That's not a level playing field. So that's the big goal behind uh, why every contractor should, get, uh, uh, should work on um, getting the CMMC certification. And of course the, the legal aspects of that is that, yes, you will not be awarded the contract and uh, you should have the certification at the time of the award. Uh, otherwise the award will not come to you. Um, and then uh, um, there have been cases uh, where in the past uh, companies have declared, yes, I am um, NIST 8171 compliant. And then finally they do discover that no, the company did not do anything at all. Uh, so that comes falls under the False Claims Act. Uh, so that's in full force. That will be enforced as well. So it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, it's not. It's 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 illegal to uh, submit a proposal without a certification, uh, without the assessments, and then um, um, and then you're not secure enough uh, to work with the DOD. Period. Yes, absolutely. And you know, self assessments are great, um, but sometimes they can be a little com bit confusing. As in, contractors may believe that they fit a certain practice when in, you know, in reality, they might be actually lacking if they were to go ahead and get the assessment. Uh, what is the prime benefit of actually getting like that consulting service from an RPO instead of doing the self-assessment and then getting assessed? Great, great, great question. Yes. So uh, anybody, any IT consultant can help you with uh, readiness. Um, uh, or um, uh, advise you on uh, CMMC and uh, how to go about uh, becoming compliant. Um, so what's the difference? So uh, the registered provider organization, RPOs, must hire um, the registered practitioners. Now, the registered practitioners have gone through the training, have taken the exam, they know, that, uh, they know what's, uh, how to uh, you know, I, how to identify uh, gaps, uh, how to identify what needs to be done, what's in place, what is not in place, uh, and, um, uh, you know, where is the FCI, where is CUI, and whatever it is. So uh, the RPs have gone through the training, they've taken the exam, they have the skills, they have the knowledge, they have the experience. And uh, CMMC has done this. Uh, they have provided that kind of a license to the registered uh, practitioners and, and, pro and provider organization. So you get the benefit of, uh, uh, you know, the, the knowledge and the right skills uh, by hiring a registered practitioner uh, to perform uh, your um, uh, readiness uh, assessment or readiness uh, advisory um, or consulting, whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's the big benefit. Right. And the biggest thing here that with CMMC especially is that they've implemented this third-party system to where... If you're a C3PAO, you can either get, you know, the advisory service or you can assess, but you cannot do both for an organization, which I think really separates the issue between maybe assessing someone, saying that they're compliant when in reality uh, they're not. So it's just double checking that and making sure those practices are in place and 
compliant. Um, Greg, so we've talked about, you know, RPOs, C3PAOs, CMMC. From what, you know, what is, what is a CMMC requiring from a supply chain standpoint? Yes, that, that's a great question. So when you think, go back to Mohan's earlier comments, so the goal or the mission of CMMC in a large part is to raise the bar for cybersecurity across the entire defense industrial base or, or DIB as we call it. And so in order to do that, um, you know, you're gonna have to include the hundreds of thousands of companies that supply things, services and goods in the whole entire supply chain up through the DIB all the way up to the prime contractors um, in order to uh, make sure that there's no weak link in the chain. So supply chain is a great uh, piece of terminology to use because it literally is a chain of suppliers that all have to comply with CMMC requirements in their own way at the appropriate level based on the type of contract they're getting uh, or bidding on. And so um, it's really important to note that you know, the, you know, the supply chain requirements are going to not, you know, you're not going to be exempted further down the line because you're a small, medium-sized business or a single, um, single proprietor business or anywhere. If you're, you know, a, if you're participating in a contract for goods and services to the DIB and you have a CMMC requirement, it's going to be passed down to you. And so at every level in the supply chain, uh, it's, it's important that every company that wants to maintain their ability to bid on work uh, takes a look at CMMC compliance and makes sure that they're achieving the right uh, level of compliance and that they're adhering to the requirements and that they're engaging the right resources uh, at the right time so they won't uh, negatively, negatively impact their businesses. So it's, uh, it's a key element to the, the entire program that everyone participate. Absolutely. So um, next we would wanted to uh, go over some of the most frequently asked questions. They were also submitted um, before the webinar took place. Um, so I would like to go through those first and then we could take in some of the questions from uh, the audience. Um, so for Mohan, you know, how long does achieving compliance take and does waiting to like implement the requirements, like how does that affect someone or an organization? Great question. Um, so um, I, again, the, you know, a, a contractor that needs to uh, work on a contract, um, they don't have a, you know, they, they can submit the proposals. Um, there are no issues there. Uh, they don't need to be certified at that time. But you have to be certified at the time of getting the award at the time of award, uh, receiving the award. Otherwise you will not be awarded the contract. So now you have, um, you know, either you can start now and then work towards your certification or your uh, compliance. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, submit your proposals and be ready for the contract. Or you can identify, okay, now it, it's gonna, this, this is the time horizon you have um, uh, to, to get ready uh, and to become compliant. So that's gonna be a stretch. Um, so, and, and the other part is that it really depends on where you are. You know, are you starting from scratch? Did you, have you gone through the 8171 uh, assessment prior to? Uh, you know, is this all new to you? Um, and, uh, you know, what's your maturity level? Do you have policy procedures? Um, have, have you been assessed before? You know, what's your experience? And uh, what's your complexity? Uh, you know, are you a small uh, business? Are you a large organization? So there are various factors that, um, that drive uh, how long it would take. And um, uh, so the best thing to do is perform a, a self-assessment and that will give you an idea as to, okay, this is where we are, this is where we wanna get to and it's gonna take you know, this many months uh, or years. So um, that's the answer. Yes, and I have checked out the uh, the self assessment um, provided by the CMMCAB. They do a really great job of identifying exactly what they're going to be looking for during the assessment. So I think that's a great tool to either self assess or just review to make sure that you know what's going to be coming up next. Um, moving on to the next question, Greg, you know, network segmentation is. You know, very, very much required for NIST and CMMCAB. So that's not new, but how can contractors identify what's in scope for the CMMC assessment? 
Yeah, that, that's really important um, because uh, in scope is it just another way of saying boundary, right? Or what is the boundary that the assessor is going to look at when they come in and, and view how you're handling information, even down at level one, uh, when you're only looking at FCI or, or whatever your requirements are for, for basic controls, they're going to look at, you know, where the, where that information uh, is handled, is managed, is stored, processed. Um, and in some cases, you know, if you're, if your business is primarily serving the, the DOD supply chain, you know, maybe every bit of your business is touching uh, information and up at level three, it would be COI and and at various, you know, whatever level is appropriate for your contract. And so for some companies, uh, it's not everyone and it's only, you know, a portion of the business is touching that information or handling or processing that information. So that's when that concept of segmentation becomes important because you're really going to draw a boundary for the assessor to come in and say, okay, well, here's the part of our business or here are the information systems that handle, transmit, and store CUI, for example, at level three, you know, here's how we control that, here's our policies and procedures around that boundary, uh, within that boundary, and then that's what the assessor will look at. So that has a couple of benefits. Um, if you are able to um, control the scope of your assessment, it can go faster and it can be uh, less complex as opposed to something that may touch every single user in your organization, every single piece of computing um, hardware and software. And you know, that would be, you know, that would be at the high end of complexity. Whereas if, you know, you draw an appropriate boundary, you definitely limit uh, the scope of your assessment program and the scope of, of where you need to apply the, the CMMC controls and, and documentation. So uh, it can be definitely worth considering and thinking about when you plan and approach your program, uh, make sure you're thinking about the scope and the boundary. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and Greg, one of the things I really run into, um, especially when providing advisory services to contractors, is the use of mobile devices. You know, in Tech Today, they can allow us to take work from work to on the go with mobile devices. How are personally owned devices affected by CMMC requirements, especially if they use email and fire file sharing right at the use of their mobile device. Yeah, so that introduces a lot of interesting challenges and opportunities for companies that are gonna have mobile users interacting with uh, controlled information or you know, otherwise information within the compliance boundary. Um, and it does carry additional considerations or additional um, controls, if you will, uh, where if you're allowing mobile access to this uh, information within your compliance boundary, you need to make sure those mobile devices themselves are compliant. And that includes, you know, how they handle information, how they handle authentication, how they are audited and, and uh, monitored, and, uh, and, and how access is controlled to those devices and how the information that is accessed via those devices is properly um, controlled as well in terms of privacy and encryption and all the other, other things that are required. So, um, so it can actually, um, you know, although it's a, it's a productivity tool for enterprises, I think enterprises have to think about uh, as part of their compliance boundary that we just talked about a minute ago, does that include mobile devices? And if it does, how are we extending our uh, policies, procedures and controls out to those devices so that we can make sure they're, they're also compliant? Uh, and the, you know, like I said, that can include a lot of different aspects to, um, to device management. Right. Uh, but it is definitely possible. It's it's just more part of, partly how you have to consider your overall program. Yeah, so Mohan always says it best. If you don't have it, then it's not in scope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Mohan, you know the system and communications protection domain uh, within the CMMC uh, touches on a practice that includes controlling and monitoring of mobile code. So JavaScript. Um, is there a solution on the market that addresses this requirement for contractors that may not be familiar with how to implement this practice? Uh, thank you, Cassandra. Before I answer the question, um, I would like to quickly address a, a, a really, really great question on the QA um, uh, that somebody, someone asked. Um, you know, the, the timeline of certification uh, is an interesting one, um, given that it's a maturity model. Uh, so how can you put a timeline on maturity? 
Uh, I, I thought that was a really, really great question that, that um, to be answered. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Um, so there are two ways to look at it. Uh, as you know, level one uh, does not require, is not, there's no process. Uh, and it does not require any policy procedures uh, at all. Uh, so as you move from level, uh, level one to level two, three, four, five, um, of course, extremely very, very handful, maybe even just, just maybe five uh, organizations uh, need to be at level five. Uh, but most organizations uh, should be level one. And then uh, the, the, another 20 to 30 percent should be at level three, particularly depending on uh, CUI uh, present or processed or stored or not. Um, so now uh, talking about the maturity, um, yes. So the maturity level is uh, depending on the level, whether you know what documentation requirements are are are, are to be are to be uh, you're, you should be compliant, and then uh, the the uh, complexity and the sophisticatedness of your policies and procedures, and how well you implement it, how well you um, um, uh, you, uh, you, you repeat it, uh, how mature you are in terms of implementing those processes. Yes, so timeline sh will take that into account. The scoring will take that into account. Absolutely, no one will come, should come to you, no one should come to you and say, oh, you can be compliant uh, uh, for level three in six months. That is not the case. You have to understand what happened uh, in the last four months, what happened last two years, what happened in the last six months, how, are, how is an organization uh, uh, you know, practicing and, and, and implementing the process in a, in a repeated manner? That, that is taken into account. Uh, I thought I should answer that. Mm -hmm. So mobile court, yes. Um, Java, ActiveX, Flash, um, you know, anything that can uh, be downloaded and uh, uh, enabled on a browser, uh, they're all considered mobile code. And uh, lots of organizations do use them and uh, they do have policies. The most important thing is what is authorized, what is unauthorized. Uh, so without going into the specifics of uh, vendors and solutions, uh, so in general, it's about contr controlling the, uh, you know, whether the organization should be allowed to use mobile code is the first thing. And then secondly, if you do allow with a justification, then you have to, um, uh, you know, going to the basics of cybersecurity, you have to see how do you prevent at the network level, at the system level, and how do you monitor? And uh, how do you remediate? And how do you test? Uh, how do you scan? Um, so, um, you know, you apply the, the, the basics, uh, and the, the prevention, uh, detection, and recovery uh, uh, controls to mobile core as well, uh, you know, including audit of con configurations uh, and, and so on. So I hope uh, uh, that helps you. And, and there, are, there are solutions. And one more thing about CMMC. They don't say that you have to have a particular solution uh, to be implemented. Of course, if you're if you're if you're a Raytheon, if you're a large organization, uh, if you're doing everything manual like daily logs, um, they will not buy it. Uh, of course, you know you need a better system. If you're a five-person company um, and if and, and if you have uh, uh, complexity is very low, you can implement manual processes as well. So uh, um, that's the distinction. Uh, that's one thing that CMMC does not do as to, okay, uh, what kind of solutions you need to be implementing out there. Right. And, you know, some people or some people, some organizations or businesses, they actually don't even manage their IT. So, you know, Greg, if you could, like, if a contractor outsources their IT management to MSPs, you know, what are there some of the responsibilities of that MSP pertaining to CMMC and maintaining the compliance. Yeah, this, this is a really um, useful <laughs> um, discussion because especially down at the, at the small and mid-sized business level, a lot of those businesses don't staff their own IT departments and they don't have a compliance officer on staff and because their businesses are, aren't large enough you know, to justify those headcount. So uh, what do they do? And uh, many of them turn to managed service providers, as you say, for some basic IT infrastructure and management. Now, what we found is our partners in, in our partner channel have, um, many of them have been providing um, NIST uh, 800-171 consulting and have helped their com customers along with their compliance programs over the years. And what they've done is they've, a lot of them have considered, well, how, you know, how do we evolve that into providing more turnkey solutions? 
And so many of them have taken their compliance backgrounds and have applied them towards building these kind of turnkey um, compliance solutions and they offer them as a managed service to the mid-market. And I think this can be a very compelling value proposition for these companies that, that don't have the uh, resources to staff for compliance and IT management in particular, where they can outsource to a managed service provider as an option. And they offer a mix of technology and they bring their consulting expertise to bear, or they may you know, recommend uh, outside resources for uh, documentation and consulting combined with their managed service offering. There's a lot of different ways uh, to execute on that plan. But the good news is there's a lot of vendors out there thinking about it and really trying to be providing as much value as possible to the defense industrial based supply chain. And uh, knowing that CMMC is going to be a, you know, a wave that's going to come through and they really want to be in a position to help. And I think that's uh, very encouraging. So uh, yeah, like I said, many of our current partners in our in our partner ecosystem are already doing this. So uh, there is there is uh, help out there if you need it. Absolutely. Definitely important to make sure that before you sign, they actually implement those or can take on the responsibility of following that uh, requirement. Uh, Mohan, lately, you know, many organizations have been working from home, especially within the past year, and some have even switched from a workplace to at home permanently. What security criteria should be taken into account and what requirements should be maintained for CMMC compliance? Great question and timely. Um, so, you know, just because um, your uh, um, uh, model has changed, um, you know, um, uh, allowing people to work from home and log in and access the systems and networks, um, the, the the requirements still uh, are the same. And how do you meet that requirement uh, is the most important thing. Uh, for example, um, you know, you may have VPN uh, in place. Um, and then, um, um, you know, depending on how you configure the VPN uh, with credentials, with uh, two-factor, uh, ensuring that the person who is accessing the network is the person who is authorized. Um, and you may, you may say, okay, it does not matter. We can still create a connection uh, or uh, uh, provide access in the same way as, as the person who will be on the network in an office. Uh, so that's, that's how it is, is, it is done. So the simple answer is, um, uh, you know, what are your policies and procedures? And how do you ensure that uh, somebody who is accessing your network, your systems, uh, are still compliant with the policies and procedures. Uh, so that's that's the key here. Absolutely, I think VPN is is probably the best way to maintain that security boundary, um, especially for logging and auditing. Speaking of sort of the cloud-based solutions, Greg, you know they're gaining popularity within IT and. Are these types of solutions accepted for CMMC certification? And if so, do the vendors need to be FedRAMP certified? Yeah, the, it, it's, um, it's getting, it's, it may sound complicated, <laughs> but it's actually, it's a little, it's a little straightforward when you, when you peel it apart. It's, it's a great question because a lot of uh, IT services are moving to the cloud, have moved to the cloud and uh, including file uh, storage and sharing, and as well as messaging and communication and email, for example. Um, other things have, uh, have migrated there as well. And so um, the, the DFARS and the CMMC requirements that are based upon largely upon 800-171 are pretty clear on this. Um, so uh, for example, uh, if, you're, if, a, if a compliant company is using a cloud service, and that cloud service is, is helping them manage, you know, protected information within their compliance boundary, then that cloud service themselves um, has some compliance requirements. And one of them uh, is to be a um, uh, FedRAMP moderate equivalent. Um, now that could include companies that have gone through the ATO process and have a FedRAMP uh, authority to operate, but it also um, allows for companies that have achieved a FedRAMP equivalent status um, for moderate baseline and you know, let's say have been uh, assessed by a third party and can, and can uh, have an attestation that they uh, have, have met those requirements. 
So, um, so yeah, so if, if cloud services are part of your solution, are part of your IT infrastructure and, um, and are gonna be interacting or touching your CMMC boundary, um, you have to make sure those vendors are meeting the guidelines, um, but they're, pre they're pretty straightforward. Um, so, so that's something you can just bear in mind. Um, FedRAMP moderate baseline is, is one example of that. Right, and you know, staying on the topic of cloud-based environments real quick, Mohan, um, if CUI is held only in cloud-based share file shares, such as Prevail's file sharing service, or SharePoint, Google Drive, for example, are employee workstations in the company networks in scope? Great question, great scoping question. Um, so um, now, as you know, the end goal is to protect the CUI, protect the FCI. So FCI automatically uh, puts the enterprise uh, into this scope, the why? because uh, it's, it's contract information and contract information uh, could be quite, quite um, you know, can be anywhere in the, in, in the organization. It could be with sales, it could be with marketing, it could be with engineering uh, department. Um, so you know, of, of course uh, your enterprise network uh, will be in scope for FCI. For CUI, you know, it, it really depends. Uh, what's your policy procedure and uh, what's your process? So we'll, you know, for example, let's say, um, if I'm using Workstation, I am, uh, you know, authorized to use the Workstation, authorized user. Can I download the CUI to my Workstation? Mm -hmm. How then? Is it possible? So basically, it's like following the money, follow the CUI. Wherever the CUI can go, um, then that particular net network or the device is in scope. Right. And um, Greg, you know, I had, in the previous question, I had mentioned Prevail's file sharing service. Can you discuss some of the practicalities of using Prevail's file sharing service for level three certification? Sure, and um, this will be a little bit um, product oriented, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> bear with me. But, I, but we do offer end-to-end -end encryption as a service that covers uh, messaging, email, and file sharing and storage in the cloud uh, in a compliant way. So you know, we're designed to handle um, cloud storage for companies that are seeking level three compliance. And the reason I say that is, you know, all, the, all of our information is stored in the AWS Gov Cloud and a sovereign cloud, which is a FedRAMP high, impact level four or five storage facility. That's where the information is stored um, uh, in the cloud. And then when it's on devices, it's end to end encrypted on those devices and protected cryptographically um, with no means to decrypt in the middle or at the server. So there's a, there's a very strong security model based on a zero trust architecture that Prevail provides. And so that makes it very practical uh, in terms of adding it into your compliance program because it sits next to your existing technologies. It doesn't have to, um, you don't have to rip and replace your existing IT infrastructure, for example, or create a whole new domain for everybody or give everybody a new mail address. You don't need to do any of that. You can really just drop Prevail in only in the places where you need it or in the uh, areas of your uh, organization that you know manage or, or touch controlled information, for example. And then um, with less disruption, you can have this kind of world-class zero trust architecture and, and your users can take advantage of that. Um, so that's really you know, one, of the, one of the big reasons why our customers are looking towards uh, using Prevail as part of their CMMC journey. Uh, like I said earlier, it's not just technology. There's a lot more to it, but right. uh, technology can help. <laughs> and that extends into mobile devices, cell phones specifically as well, correct? It does. If they're in scope, then uh, yeah, Prevail offers mobile solutions um, as well as desktop. So we're, right. we're uh, involved in, in mobile as well. So um, uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, Alexandra, in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can pick a few questions from the QA. Um, uh, you know, there are lots of questions that are coming along. Um, so maybe we can uh, pick some of them um, that have, a lot, have not already been addressed. Uh, so um, if you could please. Yes. Um, so when it comes to NIST and CMMC being, are they a separate? Are they the same? Uh, you know, what are the requirements? Should we forget about one and just 
focus on the other, you know, what is the difference really between CMMC level three and NIST? Great question. Um, so CMMC is, uh, has everything. It's got the requirements, it's got the definitions, it's got the assessment guides, um, it's got the uh, uh, level uh, definitions. And uh, um, so it, it is based on 81171 plus additional practices. Uh, so if you are working on, if your goal is to become CMMC compliant, and if, if that is the only objective, yes, you can just rely on what's in CMMC and not worry about 81171 or, or other things. So because it, you know, 81171 is embedded uh, in the uh, CMMC uh, compliance. Right, and then um, another question we have is after the actual certification of CMMC, there is a three-year research. Is there a requirement to self-assess annually prior to the third year research? That's another great question. Um, Yes, so it's valid for three years. Now, uh, again, you know, the end goal is protecting the CUI. Let's say your network has changed. You have added uh, another network. You added more systems. And in other words, the original scope where the assessment was not performed is not accurate anymore. In other words, there is a, if, if you feel that there is a risk to the CUI, and if you have changed the scope, the, the access control is not the same uh, as uh, when it was looked by the uh, certified assessor, then it absolutely makes sense to self-declare um, that yes, I have changed it. Now I need a, a, an, an augmented uh, assessment um, so that you, know, you can provide that information to DOD and not get into any, uh, um, uh, you know, any trouble. Um, so it's, it's all about the integrity of your network, integrity of your systems and, and processes. So if you feel that uh, the scope has changed and the CUI risk uh, is different, then yes, you should be performing an assessment, going for an assessment. Um, so we don't have full details on uh, how that works. Uh, um, uh, we don't have any guidelines yet, but um, uh, that's, that's the most practical thing to do. Right. And um, so when it comes to prime contractors getting these uh, DOD contracts, how does that affect what requirement level will be needed for CMMC for those subcontractors or even below that? Right, so the contracts do specify what level uh, the contractor should be. And then, you know, uh, following the supply chain, um, so, you know, what is the subcontractor handling? Are you sharing the CUI with them? Then you are obligated to ensure that that CUI is secure which means it is your responsibility to ensure your subcontractor has the right uh, uh, mat maturity and, and, and the cybersecurity posture in order to secure the COI. So yes, the accountability and responsibility uh, flows down the uh, supply chain. Uh, so um, I, will, I will leave it at that. Right, um, thank you. So we have another one here using the um, infrastructure products, you know, software as a service, such as Google, AWS, um, it means a lot of components in the digital ecosystem are not directly managed by our organization. Uh, while our connections to those systems are managed, do we have the responsibility of beyond the normal engagement of those services, which is defined in the CMMC assessment? I'm going to take a swing at that one. I'll, um, I'll jump in because th this is a, a classic shared responsibility question. So, um, yeah, so, so that's the answer. The short answer is yes, that the responsibility is shared between the cloud service provider and you as the consumer of that cloud service. Um, both parties share in compliance uh, at the appropriate level uh, based on what you're trying to certify against. And it could, you know, mean, you know, there's more requirements the further up you go. So when you get to level three and you need you need to protect CUI, your cloud service now has to meet in a bunch of additional uh, requirements and share them with you. So um, and so basically, it's it's important to when you're doing your planning to know what level you're going to have as your objective, and then understand what your cloud service providers have to help you with along the way, and make sure as you select them that they're going to be able to play. For example, if you're going for level three. 
and you're planning to use a, a commercial email system like Gmail or, or uh, Office 365 commercial, um, you may end up having compliance challenges with those selections based on what those vendors provide for, for shared responsibility. So you may have to look at alternatives in those cases um, for the people that are, or the users that are in scope or handling the level three CUI information. Uh, they may not be able to take advantage of some of the commercial clouds um, based on uh, a shared responsibility approach. So um, there's, there's, a, there's some complexity in there and there's some trade-offs. The good news is um, there's a lot of people out there that can help uh, sort that out. And the cloud vendors themselves are pretty good at documenting and telling you about shared responsibility and what they're willing to accept or not accept. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I would say for that question. It's a great one though. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So the next one, actually, I'm, uh, I'll probably answer. Uh, to clarify, a company that is offering a gap analysis service cannot be an assessor. That is correct. Um, C3PAOs can offer advisory and assessments. However, they are not able to provide that service to the same organization, both services to the same, so they can eat either or. Um, RPOs are for advising, but not assessing. Um, so yes, there's that. Uh, next one we have here is, what is an efficient tool, uh, self-assessment tool, which would save time and effort working with an advisor? The CMCAB uh, on their website has a level one and a level three self-assessment questionnaire that's uh, readily available. Uh, Google cmcab.org or uh, Google, <laughs> either way. Um, the next one is if a subcontractor is not exposed to CUI or FCI, what CMMC requirements must be met? Uh, Mohan? Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, you know, who, who are you working with and who has asked you for the compliance and what's the reason? Um, so it, start, it starts right there. And um, so there are two, two uh, reasons why you may not want to do the CMC. Number one, uh, you are providing, uh, you know, commercial off-the-shelf products. Um, so which means your product is utilized by another supplier and uh, you directly do not handle COI or FCI. Um, so you do not have to be uh, CMMC compliant. On the other hand, um, uh, today, uh, you know, you, you, you're part of the contract and uh, uh, initially probably, yes, no FCI, no CUI. Um, you, know, you may be providing pens and pencils um, for that matter. Uh, so it, it, it's, 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 it's again a supply chain issue. Um, you know, the, who, what, what's the weakest link here? How can a, a malicious actor get information through a contractor uh, you know, and, and then jump to another contractor just by have, knowing that, okay, you are working with this contractor uh, on this project. So let me see if I can uh, go and, 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 and um, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, hack into um, or try to access that contractor's uh, information and systems and so on. So it's about, you know, wh where does the, you know, um, uh, where's the information flowing, what information is flowing and how you are uh, you, uh, part of the supply chain. So, and uh, so those are all the factors that determines whether you should be CMC compliant or not. Great, thank you. And um, I believe we have already talked about the, um, you know, certified assessor providing the CMMC consulting and advisory service, but just to touch on that again, certified assessor can provide both services, but they cannot provide it both services to the same company. Um, and then there was another question here that came in, Prevail, uh, how does the Prevail product email and storage satisfy the CMMC level three requirement? I believe we have touched on that before, but Greg, if you wanted to give a quick overview of that. Sure. Um, yeah, it's basically uh, back to the concept of shared responsibility again, um, where Prevail information is end-to-end -end encrypted and stored in um, a sovereign cloud with uh, FedRAMP high ATO and all the all the bells and whistles they need in, uh, to participate in, in a compliance boundary that is shared with a, uh, a user of that cloud service. So when we selected a cloud storage provider for Prevail, we had to, you know, we made sure we 
we selected one that was uh, providing a U.S. sovereign cloud that was meeting all the compliance requirements we needed so that when our customers were using it, they could incorporate that as part of their shared responsibility for, for CMMC compliance, which would include you know, the encryption requirement, the sovereignty, the uh, continental U.S. requirements, all the various things that come to bear uh, are, all, are all shared and met um, between the two parties. And so that's, um, that's kind of the short answer, but uh, you can get, you know, happy to take details offline. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Cassandra, I, I would like to take this question uh, that I just noticed. Um, if you don't meet the level three um, uh, you know, certification requirements, can you still be awarded level one certification? I thought that was a great question. So the way the certification is awarded is, um, which level you have completely satisfied. That's the level you will get. So um, if you have implemented everything in level one, and if you're if you partial on level three, you will be certified at level one. If you have implemented everything in level two and partial in level three, you will be certified at level two. Uh, yes, the answer is uh, yes. I thought that was a, a good question and, and uh, mm -hmm. wanted Oh, thank you so much. Um, there was another one that I um, came across. Uh, this person says, I am a five-person company that handles CUI data. Uh, we're going with a prevail solution uh, to house our CUI data and don't have a corporate network. We do have Wi-Fi throughout our manufacturing floor for personal use. We only have one corporate laptop and network printer to print uh, drawings. If is there Wi-Fi uh, within scope for a level three certification? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Juan. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can question from a security point of view. Greg, you may want to address um, uh, the shared responsibility um, uh, area for Prevail. Um, so I'm going to take a quick minute on that. So number one, um, yes, uh, the email is encrypted. Uh, you know, we, uh, I, I, we have not used the word enclave. Uh, when it comes to scoping, what is your enclave, uh, right? So uh, who has access to the email? Who can read the email? And how do you uh, enforce uh, the access controls to the email system? Uh, so that's, that's where uh, uh, the, the scoping uh, uh, needs to be addressed. And I, I'm going to give it to Greg uh, to answer the rest of the uh, question. Right. And uh, yeah, so it's we always hate to answer with it depends, but, <laughs> but it does depend on, on how you're setting up your access and who can access and by what devices. Basically, it, again, it, back to Mohan's point, it, it has to do with how you define your, your enclave or your boundary and where does the information live and, how, and where can it go. And so in the case of Wi-Fi access to CUI that may live on only one device, um, you know, we were, are we were talking about email based um, transmission or really were we talking about file transfers? And so we'd have to look at, look at it kind of case by case, but the short answer is it can be made compliant. There is a way to do it. You just have to make sure you're, you're documenting it correctly and following your own procedures and that you have the controls in place that you need. And, and maybe for some companies that means you know, let's take the Wi-Fi off outside of the scope of CUI and have some other way of doing it. Like there's a virtual desktop instance that handles that transaction. And so there's a VDI that only certain people can use and log into, and it doesn't touch the Wi-Fi and therefore that's isolated and it's out of scope. Now that's one approach or another approach might be, you know, the Wi-Fi is in scope and here's how we protect it. And, um, and here's how, here's the limits to how we control access to it. And here's how the information is protected. And here's how the, the, the actual um, device itself implements the controls we need. And so there's, a, there's, you know, again, here's where partners and, and managed service providers and other pieces of expertise can really help um, by, you know, folks that have thought this through and can help guide you on what's the best set of choices for your individual organization. That would be my the best advice I could give you instead of trying to figure it out uh, without any assistance. It, de it definitely helps to get um, some outside assistance such as an RPO or a registered practitioner to maybe provide some of that advice for you as well. So Orly, did you want to move into the uh, breakout session? We are at time.